Hi, everyone, and welcome back for part two of chapter four, uh, covering the last half of the chapter on attention. Uh, we're going to pick up with a discussion of overt versus covert attention. Then we're going to get into divided attention. And lastly, we're going to discuss attentional uh, networks and the brain. So overt attention is your um, willful engagement of attention processes through the movement of your eyes. So anytime you um, look at something intentionally around a room or around a scene, then you are engaging in overt attention. Think about um, attention as a spotlight and you can shift that spotlight using your eyes, right? This makes perfect sense. Um, we typically study over attention with eye movements using eye tracking. We've seen this before, uh, I believe in chapter one, when we, when we discussed the methods of cognitive psychology. So for example, um, maybe you work for a company that wants to know um, about how people are interacting with their website. You could do some experiments, and this happens for sure in the tech industry, where you have people come into a lab and you have them attempt to do certain tasks on a website, and you eye track them while they're doing those tasks so that you can see if uh, the areas of the website that are attracting attention are the appropriate areas of the website such that people can navigate the website appropriately and can um, uh, solve or whatever problem or accomplish whatever task they're trying to accomplish on the site. Uh, this is also a big area of research in computer human interactions, uh, which is a, a, a fabulous sort of relatively recently developed, obviously, um, field of psychology and technology that if, if you're interested in uh, maybe a career in cognitive psychology, uh, human computer interaction is, is, a, is a fabulous space to be in. It's really in high demand right now. Um, so eye movements, these overt eye movements are measured by saccades. That's the jumping of your eyes from one place to another uh, and fixations, which is how much time you spent at each spot. So uh, maybe you spent half a second at point one and a second at point two, but six seconds at point three. So the, the timing of these saccades and the length of fixations can tell us a lot about uh, the, the information that you're taking in and your attentional processes. Now, what are the things that might determine eye movements? Um, from a top-down perspective, right, your decisions, your volition, your active engagement of attention to look at certain things is obviously going to determine eye movements. But the stimuli themselves also determine your eye movements in a bottom-up sort of data-driven process called stimulus salience. So stimuli that are salient are ones that stand out and capture attention. And we know a lot about the, um, the characteristics of stimuli that capture attention. So things like color and motion and contrast um, are very attention grabbing to your visual system. Now, why might this matter, right? Let's, let's, um, let's put this into a place where you can make money using this knowledge, a uh, product design. So, one of the basic fundamental things that a corporation that sells, for example, a product in a grocery store, one of the basic things they have to figure out is how to get people to look at their products. You're walking down a grocery aisle and there's hundreds and thousands of different products and they're all kind of similar, right? This looks to be like a, the chip aisle. We've got some Pringles. We, in fact, we have lots of different types of Pringles. We've got some other type of chips. Then we've got, looks down like down there, Doritos. How do you get someone to stop and look at your product? Well, you could use some data from cognitive psychology on the types of things that capture attention. 
So, uh, for example, most of this packaging is brightly colored and produces contrast somewhere, right? So let's look at these chips kind of in the middle. Um, their top half is kind of this, you know, tan or cream hue. And then they all have this big logo that's a contrast in color. Uh, they all have probably like the name of the flavor of a chip that's a contrast in color. Notice that you can tell which flavors are which because you've got like blue flavor, you've got red flavor, you've got green flavor. The same thing with Pringles, right? You can tell which cans are which flavor immediately right off the bat. And notice that even the transition between two flavors creates its own contrast, this movement from green to red. Furthermore, Pringles is also smart because they put a face on their packaging. Remember our discussion about how faces draw attention and are evolutionary because they're evolutionarily relevant? Well, I bet you this little Pringles dude with the mustache grabs your attention due to its salience of being a face. So uh, properties of the world around you will partially determine where you look and what you look at. But of course, your knowledge, your expectations, and your um, you know, task at hand will also determine eye movements. We can bring back the idea of skein schema or skein scheme seen schema. Whew, it's tough to say. Uh, we can bring back the idea of scene schema from perception and say that typical scenes uh, that you encounter in the world have knowledge or expectations associated with them. And so that knowledge is going to guide where you look. So if I'm driving a car, I'm not looking up at the top of the building, at least I hope not. What I should be looking at are the places in the scene where I expect stimuli that are relevant to the task of driving. So the road, obviously, the sidewalk, the edge of the road. Uh, anytime I come up to a traffic light, right, that's going to kind of change the relevant um, areas that I need to look at. So uh, my knowledge of what's going on in this scene and my knowledge of my task at hand will determine my eye movements. And so we can take this all the way down to the very simple task of like making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, your knowledge of the process right, is going to direct where you look, how long you look for, and the order in which you look at things. So these are knowledge-based top-down determinants of eye movements. Now, overt attention can be contrasted with covert attention. Covert attention is a little more difficult to understand because it involves the movement of attention without moving your eyes, which seems counterintuitive. The directing of attention without moving your eyes. It's possible. We know it is. We can study it. Uh, and you can even kind of try and do it. So uh, wherever you are right now, uh, pick a spot maybe on the wall um, or across the room uh, directly in front of you. And I want you to stare at that spot. Focus your, your overt attention, your eyes, on a particular spot directly in front of you. Then I want to see, I want you to see if you can keep your eyes in the same place and shift your sort of awareness, your attentional awareness to something else in the room without moving your eyes. It's weird and it's kind of difficult, but you can do it. And we can actually study this process such that we now know um, that the spotlight of attention is often determined by eye movements, but that spotlight is somewhat independent of eye movements as well. So famous experiment that um, uh, by a man named Posner and colleagues, a famous experiment that showed us the existence of covert attention. 
So I'm going to set up the, the experiment for you. Participants kept their eyes fixated on a computer screen on this crosshairs in the middle, right? The plus sign. Then above the crosshairs, they would see an arrow which served as a, a cue. It would either point to the right or it would point to the left. They're continuing to stare at the crosshairs, right? They're instructed not to move their eyes. They get a cue to the right or the left, and then they would receive a target. What they were told is that their target is a square, and as soon as they see a square, hit the space bar. That's it. Keep your eyes on the crosshair, and as soon as you see a square, hit the space bar. So, um, fixated on the crosshair, the Q can either be valid, meaning uh, in the in the top trial here, the Q, the arrow, actually correctly points to where the, the square is going to be, or the Q can be invalid, where it incorrectly points. It points in the opposite direction of where the Q occurs. So keep in mind that the Q, the arrow, has nothing to do with the task. The task is hit the space bar as soon as you see a square. That's it. Ignore the arrow. Hit the space bar as soon as you see the square. But what they found is that when the cue is valid, when the arrow correctly predicts the location of the square, people are faster at responding to the square. Well, yeah, they've been given a cue, right? They've been, they've been given a... Um, uh, sort of a head start on responding to that square. But let's think about what that head start is because they're not moving their eyes, right? They're keeping their eyes on the crosshairs. And yes, they do actually make sure that people keep their eyes on the crosshairs. Uh, if you violate that, then you get kicked out of the experiment, right? So people are actually keeping their eyes on the crosshairs. The arrow is directing their covert attention without eye movement such that this arrow causes covert attention to sort of wander up here to the top right and if you're already attending to this location right you're not attending to an object yet you're attending to this location then the appearance of this square means that we can respond faster and that's what we see valid trials have a faster reaction time than invalid trials because on an invalid trial, your covert attention is kind of wandering up here to the top left. And then when the square appears, it's on the opposite side of the screen. So covert attention or so attention has to shift over there. That shift takes time. That's an added layer of difficulty in processing. And that's reflected in a um, about a 60 millisecond difference in responding between valid and invalid trials. So the next big question about attention is how many things can you do at once? How good are we at dividing attention? So divided attention is going to depend on a few things. Um, First is how difficult is the task? So we bring back our question of cognitive load or perceptual load. And the second is how much practice do you have at the task? Because as we said before, remember kind of our definition of expertise is using repetition and practice to take something that is a high load task and turn it into a low load task. So in 1977, uh, some cognitive psychologists used um, a combination experiment that, that used memory and attention to monitor and study divided attention. So uh, here's what happened. Participants were given a target. So they see the number three and they say, your job is to watch the computer screen and we're going to present a series of test frames really, 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 really fast. Like they're up there for a quarter of a second. Boom, 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 boom. And they're flying through these test frames. And the test frames can have 
um, distractors. They can have random dot patterns. They can have other numbers. They can have letters. But eventually, you get the target. And the task is to say, was the target from, uh, from the beginning in the presentation of test frames? So did you see a three, right? In these 20 test frames that came boom, 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 boom. Did you see a three? That's it. Super easy. You would think. The problem is that these are going so fast, people are trying to process that incoming information really, really, really quickly. That's difficult. It's a high load task, while at the same time, you're trying to remember your target, a three. So this is a divided attention task where people are doing multiple things at once. They're monitoring four potential targets. They're remembering their target from previously. And then they're trying to keep up with like the speed of change of all of this rapid succession of test frames. What they found is that at first people aren't that great. Performance is like, you know, between 50 and 60%. But then after you've done this for 600 trials, so imagine sitting there doing this 600 times, people report the task becoming automatic and performance increases with practice. So our X axis here is number of trials. So zero would be, you've never done it before and performance kind of sucks. And then as we do more and more and more trials, performance gets better. We get better at noticing the target. And once we hit 600 trials, we max out, you know, in the sort of mid to high 80% uh, correct range and performance persists at about that level um, for sort of the rest of our, you know, over 1200, uh, I believe they went almost up to 2000 trials. So once we achieved proficiency, that's sort of 85 to 90% performance, performance was maintained and people reported not needing to try that hard anymore because they'd figured it out. They figured out the task. They got better at it. And so the task became easier. Um, a really good analogy, I think, is professional athletes and professional musicians. So imagine um, you're, so I play the guitar. Um, imagine you're learning how to play the guitar. Uh, I can tell you what it was like. Uh, at the very beginning, it's really difficult. Like, it is to learn any other musical instrument. It takes so much effort and so much concentration to get your fingers in the right place, on the right strings, on the right fret, sort of the place on the neck of the guitar. So you're worrying about your, typically, uh, if you're right-handed, you're worrying about your left hand on the strings, sort of making the right shapes to make the right sounds. And then you're also worried about your right hand because that's your rhythm hand right? That's strumming the strings or picking the strings in the appropriate pattern. And so you're doing like lots of things at once. You've got your right hand rhythm. You've got your left hand um, doing the fingering of the, of the guitar neck and the appropriate um, notes. You're moving up and down the guitar neck. And then maybe you're reading music or you're, you're, you're playing along with a song in, in time and rhythm. There's a lot of stuff going on and it's really, really difficult to pick up. But if you put in the time and if you just keep trying and keep trying and keep trying, pretty soon it gets easier. It gets automatic. What ends up happening is that the, um, the orientation and the placement of your fingers in your left hand starts to become automatic such that you don't have to really think about it. It just, your hand, it just does it, right? Your hand just goes there. Um, and once this automaticity is achieved, you can shift your attention because now what you've done is you've taken what was a high load task and made it a low load task. So you can shift your attention and worry about other things like coordinating with the drummer or coordinating with the singer or 
knowing when to play a little louder or play a little softer, right? You can start to incorporate other elements that start to make you an expert musician. The same thing with like LeBron James and basketball. Let's think about this. Uh, when you're first learning how to play basketball, just the very act of dribbling and moving the ball and having your hands and your elbows and your feet in the right position, you know, shooting, uh, getting the distance and the height correct. Like when you're first learning, that takes up all of your perceptual and attentional load. LeBron James doesn't think about any of that. It just happens. His body just knows what to do because he's done it a million times. What LeBron James is thinking about is actually what you see here in this picture. He's coordinating with other players, right? He's communicating about something that's higher order, a play, a strategy, maybe a mismatch uh, on the opponent's side. Maybe um, there's some time crunch, right? It's the third quarter is ending and we need to do this really quickly. So he's thinking about all that more higher level strategic stuff. LeBron isn't thinking about how to dribble the basketball. He's already automatized that process, thus reducing its perceptual and attentional load so that he can divert and divide his attention to other tasks that are more important, like strategy and communication. So, of course, this all begs the question, what about cell phones? Well, turns out, as we all should know by now, don't use your cell phone when you drive. Um, a 100 car naturalistic driving study, meaning they actually had, they actually collected data using video recorders in people's cars as they were driving around in their daily lives. If you're using a cell phone, you are four times more likely to be in an accident. Uh, and in a simulated driving uh, experiment, so like a computer simulator, um, participants on the phone missed twice as many red lights. They took longer to apply their brakes, meaning they're more likely to be in an accident. And it didn't matter whether they were using a hands-free or a, a, a cell phone in their hand. So, which seems counterintuitive because lots of states have laws that you can't touch your cell phone, but you can use it if you have like a Bluetooth. But what our evidence from cognitive psychology suggests is that even if you're using a hands-free cell phone, that conversation, right, whatever you're doing on the cell phone still takes away attentional load, right? It, it costs something. And that cost takes up attentional resources that should be dedicated to driving. So now driving has less resources available to it and thus is still more dangerous, even when you have a hands-free cell phone. Now, one really interesting um, uh, sort of characteristic of attention that we have found in these studies is that attention has limits. Um, one of these limits is best characterized as inattentional blindness. So, in this experiment, participants were asked to judge um, whether the blue bar or the green bar was slightly longer, right? Which one is longer? And then here it looks to me like it's kind of the blue bar. Um, but that's not what the researchers cared about. What they cared about was that every so often, this little square would boop, pop up on the screen. That's it. Participants are doing this task over and over and over again. And every once in a while, boop, a little square pops up on the screen. And then participants are asked, did you see anything different, right? Was, did anything change? So basically they're trying to see, were participants able to attend to this square, even though it was unexpected, and even though it was directly in their eyesight, right? You would think that something that pops up right in front of you on the computer screen. The people are staring at the computer screen and they miss it. People don't see it. They are blinded by their inattention to this area. 
Why are they inattentive to this area? Because they're spending all of their attentional resources trying to decide this little fine grained distinction between the vertical and the horizontal lines. So the, um, the lack of perception to a stimulus that is clearly in your visual field is known as inattentional blindness. Uh, what I want everyone to do, some of you may have seen this video before. If so, that's fine. Um, you know, humor yourself, humor me, and watch it again so we're all on the same page. But what I want everyone to do is click on this link or copy-paste it, watch the video, follow the instructions, and what I want you to do is count how many times the basketball is passed by the team in black T-shirts, the black team. How many times is the basketball passed by the team in black t-shirts. That's it. Watch the whole video, watch all the way to the end, and then come back to the lecture. So go ahead and press pause and do that now. Okay, hopefully you're back. Uh, this is a very famous experiment in cognitive psychology on inattentional blindness. And hopefully you watched the video all the way to the end and you saw that, yes, in fact, there was a gorilla, or a, rather a man in a gorilla suit walking through the video right in front of your eyes. Um, roughly somewhere around 30 to 50% of people on their first trial completely miss the gorilla. So if you saw the gorilla, you know, you're in the slight majority, something like, uh, you know, 50 to 70% of people see the gorilla the first time. But it's quite astounding that anywhere from 30 to 50% of people miss the gorilla the first time, even though it's right in their field of vision. Okay, so we're going to move forward and discuss how, so um, with overt and covert attention, we were using the analogy of a spotlight, sort of a, a think about a spotlight moving around a room and that spotlight is your attention. Well, that's location based attention kind of, right? You're moving it around a space, but attention can also be bound to objects rather than just physical spaces. So we're gonna sort of uh, investigate this distinction between location and object-based attention. So um, in a series of experiments, uh, Eagley and colleagues showed participants two side-by-side -side rectangles followed by a cue, right? So this um, one piece of the rectangle would highlight, then the cue would turn off, and then participants had to respond in a particular way when the target was presented. The target here was the shading of one quadrant of the rectangle. So uh, maybe if this was shaded, right, you, you hit the space bar as soon as the shading comes up. That's the task here. You hit the space bar when the shading comes up. Uh, what they found is that these numbers here on the side are how quickly people responded. So obviously, if you get cued in the top right, then you're faster at responding when the target is in the top right, 324 milliseconds to, to hit the space bar. If the target occurred at C, then you were slower. But if the target occurred at B, you were slower than A, but faster than C, even though from A to B is the same distance as A to C. So I'll say that again. If the target is consistent with the Q, so position A, you're really fast. It facilitates your reaction time. If the Q is on a different object, so point C, then you're slower. It takes you longer to react. If the target is at point B, which is the same distance from A to C, 
A to B and A to C are the same distance. So if attention is only about a location of a spotlight, then B and C should be equal because they are equidistant from the Q location. But that's not what happens. B is faster than C. It's not quite as fast as A, but it's faster than C because the queuing of position A sort of also cues the entirety of this right-handed triangle. The object sort of gets a piece of the queue such that even the bottom of this object is faster than it quote unquote should be. So the queuing cues a location, but it also provides a queue for the entirety of the object. This is everything I just said. So we can think of the uh, effect of attention as being enhanced and spreading throughout the object. So what this shows us is that attention can be based upon the environment, right? Scenes. Uh, it can be based on locations and it can be based on specific objects. Uh, this is helpful in dynamic events that, uh, for example, involve motion, right? So tracking a football or tracking a baseball. Um, you want your attention not to be in a location. You want attention to track that object no matter where it moves. So we need both of these systems, or really you could kind of think about them as three in a way, um, location-based, environments, or sort of context-based, and then object-based. Another fault of attention that teaches us about attention is change detection. Change detection is your ability to detect changes in an object or a scene or the environment. So what I want you to do, I want you to hit pause and I want you to follow this YouTube link. It's a video that I think is about four minutes long, five minutes long. Go ahead and watch that uh, and then come back and hit play to continue the lecture. So go ahead and do that now and then hit play when you're ready to uh, finish up the lecture. Okay, I hope you're back. Um, and I hope that video was really enjoyable. I, I find it uh, really fun and interesting and enjoyable that you can, in fact, be looking at something and have sort of a brief occlusion, right? Um, sort of the, the the very first example, the, the guy getting up from the computer, walking to the next room, the little cut scene, the little cut in the scene um, makes you blind to many of the changes including potentially the change that it's a completely different person, right? When he walks into the next room. So change detection or or change blindness uh, can be quite dramatic and, and um, quite surprising. Now we can also think of this in a sense as, as the, the counterpoint to the gorilla, right? Inattentional blindness um, and change blindness are sort of intertwined, right, and change detection, they're all kind of talking about similar processes. Right? So we can think about this as also involving that uh, video with the gorilla. Okay, now we're going to shift gears. We're going to talk about two more things. Um, binding, which is uh, has to do with object attention or attention to objects and how your brain deals with the different um, characteristics of objects. And then we're gonna discuss uh, attentional networks in the brain. So binding is the process by which features of objects, such as their color, form, motion, and location are combined to create our perception of a coherent object. So let 
the confusing thing about objects is that your brain processes all of these characteristics separately. Color, orientation, motion, curvature, shape, depth, all get split up. And then they have to be bound back together in order for us to um, perceive, recognize an object. So what ends up happening is that an object enters what's known as the pre-attentive stage. This pre-attentive stage is where you analyze the features, the color, the shape, the size, the motion. Once you focus attention, the features are combined back together to form a perception. So this is, again, this sort of um, intrinsic tie between perception and attention. How do we know that this is what happens? Well, we can study it. So the pre-attentive stage is automatic, does not require attention or effort, and you are completely unaware of this process. Think of this as the stage where all those little neurons back in your visual system are going, ooh, I see green. Ooh, I see a square. Ooh, I see motion to the left. That's what's happening in the pre-attentive stage. In the, sorry about that, focused attention stage, attention comes into play in order to, to combine those features back together and allow for, um, higher order processing of objects. Now, one way that we know this happens is through the study of what's called illusory conjunctions. Illusory conjunctions. So what happens in these experiments, the first of which or the most influential of which was done in 1982, participants are shown uh, sequences of stimuli on cards that look like this. This is probably done on a computer screen actually. So we have a black one and a black eight, a blue sort of hollow triangle, a red triangle, a yellow circle, and a green hollow triangle. So there's a couple of different things going on here. There's shape, there's size, there's number versus shape, there's color, and then there's whether something is sort of solid or hollow. And so you, you present these to people extremely rapidly, and then you ask them to list all of the objects they saw. And so what ends up happening is that people occasionally swap around the features. People will report like a red circle or they'll report that the big triangle was whole, it wasn't hollow. Or they'll report that the small triangle was green or they'll report that the eight was yellow. What this tells us is that somewhere in your brain's processing of these objects, it breaks them apart into their features and then has to put them all back together. We also know about this from a syndrome called balance syndrome, B-A-L-I-N-T apostrophe S. Uh, and this syndrome is related to damage, sort of bilateral damage, so both sides of the brain, uh, in an area of the parietal slash occipital lobe. So this is the back of the brain. And we're looking at this area that kind of connects your occipital lobe, which is vision, to the parietal lobe, right, which is motion and object perception. So when you have damage to these areas of the brain, you end up with the inability to focus on objects and a high number of these illusory conjunction errors. So something about this, this connection between the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe is where we sort of put all the pieces back together for object perception. You can think about your occipital lobe as breaking it apart, and then the transition to your parietal lobe is putting all the features back together. 
So this is mostly bottom up. Um, top down processing does have an influence, but um, top down processing can never fully get rid of illusory conjunctions. It can decrease them, but um, you you're mostly not in control of this process. Uh, it is it is beyond your sort of willful um, knowledge based strategic or top down ability to 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 do this accurately. You can improve it a little bit by by knowing what to expect, um, but this is pretty much out of your control as a bottom up data centered processing element of attention. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the physiology of attention. Um, attentional networks in the brain are largely distributed across the brain because attention requires the coordination of lots of different brain areas to do specific jobs. Um, when you start to attend to something, obviously there's a neural response. We can detect it in an fMRI. We can see the sort of presence of attention in your brain. It's just not in any one specific area. It's, it's sort of a larger, more global coordination of activity in the brain. Uh, and in fact, specific brain areas will respond um, uh, specifically to different arenas of attention. And this was sort of shown in a sort of distributed sense that different areas of the brain are all involved in um, attentional processing by having participants look at different areas of these um, sort of funky stimuli. And as they look at different areas, different areas of the brain begin to respond. So this is a little tough to make out, but basically uh, think of this as a brain scan. Um, and the yellow parts are sort of where um, uh, the most activity is happening. And as we move from A to B to C in the stimulus, we can see the area of yellow moving in the brain scan. So what this tells us is that attention is not housed in a single part of the brain. Attention is distributed and coordinated across the brain. And so not surprisingly, just like you have with perception, uh, you have two major attentional networks and they basically correspond to those perceptual networks, the dorsal attentional and the ventral uh, attentional. The ventral attentional network is associated more with bottom up attention. The dorsal attentional network is associated more with top down attention. Well, that's it for chapter four. Thanks for watching and listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this lecture and the chapters are uh, the chapter uh, on attention. Uh, tune back in for the next chapter, chapter five. Thanks, everybody, and I will talk to you later.